All right, now we are going to move right on to our next presentation, which is going to be given by Ikarat Sabur. Ikarat works, he's the director of the International Institute of Peace Studies at the Asian Muslim Action Network in Bangkok. And he's going to share an overview and background of the current conflict involving the Rohingya Muslim population in Western Burma, and also how it, the, the current conflict that started in 2012 has led to an increase in human trafficking in neighboring countries such as Thailand and Malaysia. least heard by the international community and it's really important to understand why um, this is being marginalized and continue to be uh, marginalized. So having a talk about this topic is very really imperative, especially in this event um, that we um, titled the conference uh, Human Dignity and Humiliation. Um, before we, 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 we proceed, um, I'd just like to briefly respond to the uh, final question of the last uh, presentations like why Thai government um, want refugees to leave the country. It has always been a wish of the Thai government to keep um, the Rohingyas or, or, or the refugees of different uh, ethnic groups in Thailand. But we are working on a military ground um, because we have been to border uh, with, uh, with Burma. And um, for that is 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 the uh, it's also UNHCR that is always in conflict with the Thai government when it comes to dealing with the um, refugees issues. So having refugees return back to the country would actually help um, both sides. And UN always complained that um, many organizations, even the Thai government, have too much expectation on UNHCR. It has limited resources. Um, it also has limited um, human resources. And for the Thai government, uh, it always say that what um, Thai government has done is more than ratification of the Refugee Convention. It has done more than that because it has allowed um, CAM to exceed, allow UNHCR um, to operate. So we always, you know, uh, witness this kind of argument back and forth between UNHCR and the Thai government. Now we try to look at um, issue of Rohingyas. There are four uh, main. Um, sections that I will be covering for this historical background to actually help us understand who Rohingya are. Um, so I will briefly deal with the historical background. The second part is the conflict um, that took place in our current state. It's not a new conflict. It didn't start in 2012, but it um, has started even right after the formation of the country. Then we will deal with the issue of the um, migration or human trafficking as a result of the internal conflict in the country and the last part of the efforts uh, in you know mit um, mitigating the conflict uh, inside the country and the problems of the uh, Rohingyas at regional level and I'll talk a bit about the work that we do in response um, to, to the problem inside our current state and also uh, regionally in ASEAN. Okay, so it is a map of our current state Right? So it borders uh, Bangladesh uh, with Nath River uh, in between Bangladesh and 
and, and Arakan State, also Bardichin State is a very problematic area that we discussed this morning in Matway division and run into the south. Okay, there are about 3.27 uh, million uh, populations in Arakan State, most of whom are Arakan Buddhists and Rohingyas, Muslims. But within Muslim community, you are you also have different ethnic groups like Malay, Chinese Muslim, you know, um, and South Asian Muslim from Pakistan or from India uh, due to historical background came long time back. You also have Shin ethnic and Mat, also Hindu community living side by side in this region. Um, so originally this place was called Kalamuk, okay, in third century. And the term Kala is really uh, very insulting and uh, how do you call it? Ligatory? Uh, uh, right? Very degrading. Yep. Now, in, 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 in Myanmar. So it's actually referred to people with black skin, those belong to um, untouchable class. Um, then, in 4th to 10th century, we started seeing development of the um, that uh, that the civilization, the Vasali civilization. So Navadi basically referred to the um, Brahmin community and uh, Vasali Mahayana Buddhist community, right? But in seventh century, we started seeing the migration of the Arabs, um, traders, and settled in Bangor, including our town state, and that we see the emergence of the Chandra dialogue. Uh, sorry, Chandra dialogue. Rohingya Chandra dialect, which is similar to the dialect currently used by ethnic groups in Chittagong, which is part of Bangladesh today. Now, um, we also have um, strong evidence that refer to the um, existence of the Muslim Empire in 1430, right? So the region was actually ruled by um, the Muslim kings. Um, the prominent ones include uh, Suleiman Shah and Salim Shah. And then in 1784, the Burmese king uh, invaded, and that is when um, the, 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 the Burmese became the dominant group in that region. Then we also have the British rule in 1826. Rohingya also enjoyed as a privilege. Many of them um, were sent to British India. They were also uh, served, they were also in the um, British. Uh, military in, in India, uh, in British India uh, Empire. And despite re the re repeated conflicts and wars, Arakanese Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu, Christian somehow live in harmony. So basically, you, can, you also have the evidence of peaceful coexistence among um, people of different ethnic backgrounds, religious backgrounds. Um, clashes are somehow natural in different, um, you know, multi religious, multi ethnic communities. Okay. Then what happened to um, Rohingyas after the independent? I will talk a bit about um, conflict and clashes, also the violent incident took place before this period, but we want to briefly talk about the post-independent Arakan. Now the Burmese government said that Rohingyas are not Burmese, they are not part of the uh, recognized um, ethnic communities uh, among the 35, right? But then in 1954, um, Udu somehow recognized Rohingya as one of the ethnic groups in Myanmar. And Rohingya had their own um, radio program, which was broadcasted um, through the Burma Broadcasting Service, which was uh, the government official uh, radio program. And 1959, Uba Sri, the Prime Minister, stated that Rohingya had equal rights like other races um, in Burma. So it's very clear. Also, uh, in the first encyclopedia, of, of, of Myanmar. So mentioned Rohingya as one of the key ethnic group. Um, however, some people argue that the exclusion of Rohingya started um, right after um, the Bangalore Agreement because there was no representation of Muslim community, no representation of Rohingya, and that is when um, the Muslim got excluded from the Burmese uh, community. But the reality is that you have uh, historical evidence as like this that actual ascertained um, the dignity and rights of Rohingyas in Burma. Okay, then as I mentioned, 
the conflict did not start in 2017. Rather, it started long time back, actually during the British rule um, in 19, uh, uh, 1942 before the independence. As a result, as a, as a result of the divide and rule tactics, trying to divide the two communities based on religious and ethnic identities. So, what happened that is about 100,000 Rohingyas um, were killed and 50,000 fled to Bangladesh, and they could not return back to their uh, ancestral land. Um, many of them also, uh, you know, continue staying in, in, in other parts of Bangladesh, not just only in in in, in Jitogong or in. Um, the border province. And in 1949, we also had an attack by the military uh, together with the Rakhine, I would say, hardliners. And 1962, uh, there was a growing sense of nationalism, and this is kept and launched by the military government, basically by Nandi, who actually regarded um, Rohingyas as non Muslim, uh, sorry, non, non, non Burmese, right? Um, at the same time, the, tag, the attack did not only target um, the Muslim, but targeted those who actually um, had the black skin color or a bit, you know, dark skin color. Because at that time, the Indian, including Hindu, had an influence over uh, national economy, and that was seen as a threat to the status quo of the um, military government at that time, right? So it was a fear that there would be foreign domination. And that would lead to the disintegration of the state. Basically, it is the um, political rhetoric invented by the by the government. And in 1965, um, Rohingya BBS was halted. Apart from BBS, there was also political party, and Rohingya also had um, their MPs and representative in the parliament. Some of them have been released recently. Okay. Then um, we also had a major so-called massacre or violent incidents, like thousands of people were killed between 1967 to 1968. Um, destruction of ancient religious uh, places, of sacred spaces, not just only mosques, but also Hindu temples as well uh, during that time. Uh, by 1978, over 200,000 Muslims fled the country again due to fear of persecution. Most of them ended up in Bangladesh, and that is why now when we wanted to come back to the country, they are said to be illegal immigrants from Bangladesh. Okay. In 1982, um, the government introduced the citizenship law, which deprived the basic human rights of Rohingya. The newly born children um, would not get um, a birth certificate, a ID card, and citizenship. So it is when, when the, the problem started that we are facing today about the citizenship regime. Okay, then you have um, Taya or Clean Nation Operation in 1991, forced labor harassment, rape, or arbitrary detention. In 1982, over 250,000 people took shelter in Bangladesh again. So we have lots of Rohingyas um, critically migrated to Bangladesh as a result of violent and war. In 1994, um, we have a huge confiscation of land. Um, of the Rohingyas in the kind of state. Uh, we also have the problems that started in 2012 that gained international attention. Um, it started with the incident of one Rakhine woman was raped, and basically what happened, the government actually conducted investigation. Some of the members of the investigation committee decided not to continue because they found out that, in fact, the lady was not raped, but they were basically um, it. Um, okay, skip this part. Okay, so what happened with current situation? We have a segregation policy. Now, Rohingyas are declared illegal in the country. They are put in camp and they're not allowed to go outside the designated area um, inside Burma, right? And the government actually applied the same matter in other, uh, as in other states. Divide and rule. They try to make sure that Rohingyas cannot go back to their homes by, um, you know, laying uh, landmines, you know, around the community, so that if Rohingya wanted to go back home, they get killed by the landmines, right? Um, and we also have the privation of rights to return and movement, as I mentioned. Forced concentration in the isolated camp, apartheid. Um, for example, I'm a Muslim. Uh, I remember when I went to. Uh, to uh, to seek way, which is allow you know 
foreigners are allowed to go to sick bay. Um, some of my Muslim friends also were not allowed to actually stay at the hotel because they are afraid that the hotel owners are afraid that their compounds will be attacked by the um, uh, Rakhine Buddhists. So basically, if you are Muslim, doesn't matter where you're from, it will be difficult for you to actually be there. But now it's getting worse because even uh, humanitarian workers, the white humanitarian workers from the US or from European countries, they become the target. Some of the journalists got attacked when they are found out to write report, cover report in favor of Rohingyas. So the situation is getting uh, more and more intensified. Okay. Independent movement, right? Uh, basically, <coughs> The reason why Rohingyas are most vulnerable in the world because they are different from other ethnic groups. They don't have a very organized um, armed movement like uh, KNU, you know, DKBA, or, or um, the armed movement in Kachin State. However, at the beginning, they used to have the military operations. And in fact, they were very active in independent movement. They were actually side by side with Wong Sa as well. Um, but now somehow they got demobilized and very, they became very, very weak now, right? You may heard about an attack in India on Ilakaya, right? And some people said that possibly it was done by the Rohingyas militant. They couldn't operate in, um, in, in, in Burma, so they had to actually attack so-called separate space as the way to express their dissatisfaction in another, in another country. But um, in reality, they are very weak, they are not organized at all. Okay, so what are the root causes of the conflict in Arakan State that caused statelessness and division? The government tried to frame it as the inter interethnic conflict or communal conflict, but the reality is that um, this has been conditioned by the government, right? It's a divide and rule policy applied just like other states. You have the division between um, uh, Christian and Buddhist in current state as to weaken the liberation movement, right? So actually the same tactic applied in the Rakhine state. Um, there was no leadership in the post-independence year, but the strong leadership it was the military rule, right? It was the eviction of Rohingya and transmigration of Mark and Shin in Rakhine state. So basically, the new ethnic groups were basically um, uh, transmigrated to Arakan State as the divine and rule um, technique. Also, application of draconian law, deprivation of citizenship, um, and there was no employment as such. Okay. If you look at human rights relations in Arakan State, you find that they are somehow compatible to the acts of genocide, as mentioned in Article 6 of uh, 2002 Rome Statute, right? The killing uh, of members of the group, right? Bodily and mentally harm, uh, inflicting condition of life that they rather die and then leave the country at sea or over land, uh, restriction of marriage, birth, right? And uh, this one is not found yet in, in our times, the transfer of children to other ethnic group, but at least the four categories have been examined and continue to persist in, in our current state. Okay, so now we have already seen a clear um, situation in our current state that is difficult for Rohingya to survive, um, and as a result, they may affect the country, or they have become the victim of human trafficking first, there are push factors, and there are also pull factors as well, that they may gain a better life in another country. So they have become the victim of human trafficking, and human trafficking network is well organized, right, across the regions, actually. Um, you find that there are only Rohingyas who have been trafficked, and often Rohingyas have been trafficked together with those who have formed Bangladesh. So if you study the route of, of trafficking, it started from Bangladesh. Right? And the same boat goes to uh, Rakhine State and then comes along uh, you know, down Thailand to Malaysia and basically the destination would be Australia. Okay? 
you also have impunity of the human traffickers because very often we found that there are authorities involved in human trafficking and the government also sometimes you know know about it. It's very interesting. We had a series of dis uh, discussions with the National Human Rights Commission and also different stakeholders in the country. Um, the National Security Council of Thailand basically said that it's very clear that um, Rohingya are trafficked, but then the police, especially the immigration police, IDC police, would say that or not mention that because when you admit or endorse uh, human trafficking, then it becomes the obligation of Thai state to take care of Rohingya. So this is one of the, of, of, of the factors of for impunity. First, uh, there are people involved benefit from human trafficking. Secondly, the government doesn't have political will to admit it because it becomes a uh, government responsibility to take care of these people. Then you have, again, cooperation with the insiders, um, denial of reality, as I mentioned already. Uh, and clear policy towards Rohingya. There is no clear policy towards India in Thailand. Uh, Rohingyas were basically detained in temporary detainment center in different um, police stations, supposed to be temporarily, right, and for a few people, but they ended up being in a small cell over a period of years. The government thought that they would be able to solve the problem in one month. Later on, they found out that it was a dead lock problem. They had no uh, clear policy, right? Um, and they, they are treated badly in a detainment camp um, and women and children are also at risk men are usually detained in the police station women and men would be um, under different um, uh, centers um, under the ministry of human uh, social development and human security but then uh, we also found out that some of the children and women have become the victims of rape and again um, commercial exploitation, the sexual exploitation um, against against children and women. Okay. okay, so how are they treated? They actually held in remote camps, right? Um, usually in the jungle in southern Thailand. After they got transferred, they would be put in different camps, they would be forced um, to work as a forced labor in rubber plantations. Um, many of them were tortured and killed. They were tortured because basically these traffickers know who are the parents or relatives of these people. They would contact them, they would beat them, and then let them cry scream over the telephone and force their relative to pay amount between 2,000 and 5,000 US in order to get them released. Um, and British government are basically in Thailand or Malaysia. Okay. Um, a couple of weeks ago, no, a month ago, I think it started in, in, in December, we had a series of major crackdowns um, on the traffickers in Thailand because the government can no longer uh, tolerate. I think the, the police stations were overwhelmed, uh, they had no clear policy, because, and also because of political situation also reinforced this. Uh, at the same time, they were afraid that um, they will be sanctioned by the US because already Thailand is if I'm, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Thai 2 or 3, um, because if you are uh, blacklisted because of human trafficking, then you probably um, face serious uh, sanctions by, by a Western country. So basically, there were a series of crackdowns and, 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 and lanes and, and raids, and that actually led to the change in um, strategy of trafficking. So what happened now? They would actually park the big ships um, in the sea and then transfer the working from one ship to another ship, right? And put them in small islands. So this is one of the strategies. And they actually um, So they have changed the, the, the center of operation. Thailand was a primary target. Now Malaysia has become a place where Rohingya would be um, trafficked to. The camps continue to be built uh, in Malaysia, especially in Kedah and in Penang. And also, I think some sources, um, the Malaysian authorities are also involved in 
um, allowing these people to come in. As you know, Malaysia is in need of the um, labor because of the growing economy, loss of construction. Um, so it has become a new new target. So this also address um, the question raised this morning whether um, this anti human trafficking in Thailand would lead to uh, the end of human traffic is not. It, it, it doesn't actually help. It went reinforced and it just shipped from one place um, to another place. Um, and the, the, the NGOs community also complained and protested against Thai government. A uh, response from the police um, authorities concerned would be it's much better to let them go to natural you know, channels rather than turning them over to the Burmese government where they will be persecuted, right? So now somehow, I don't know whether it's answered your question regarding the refugee um, camps in Thailand, but they are somehow related, even though they are different territory. Okay, uh, before we proceed with the conclusion, I'd just like to mention a few things about the role of UNICEF and the ASEAN. In fact, um, UNICEF did offer the Thai government to do RSD, the Refugee um, Status Determination, but then it could not do so because the Thai government does not allow. Right? First, it doesn't have the clear um, mandate to do, to, do, to do RSD for Rohingyas. It doesn't have mandate to do for other groups because of the Mediterranean ground. Um, it was allowed to work with other ethnic groups and, uh, and, and, and refugees of other nationality, but when it comes to a growing issue, they are not allowed to do so. It's also willing to actually assist Thai government to set up system, but again, without endorsement from the Thai government, it cannot proceed. So it's really important for us to understand the limitation and perspective of UNSCR as well. It somehow can collaborate with Thai government, but only through the um, legislative framework. So it has to be very, very, uh, they have to play safe. The Thai government will have to use the um, parliament, parliamentary channel in order to come up with perhaps a special ministerial solution in order to address with this particular issue, which is possible, but it's really up to the government whether they want to do or not. Um, regarding IPP, I think um, UNSCR does have possibility to work with IDPs. If you look at um, different camps in Sikwe, the city of Patai camp in Sikwe, we have many UNSCR um, workers working there. And you also have UNSCR you know, visibility in Sikwe. But again, it is because of the government of Burma that want um, UNSCR to repatriate these people to another country. Right? So, the factor is being determined by um, the host country and uh, the government, right? And ASEAN, in fact, um, the former Secretary General, Suin Kisuman, did try his face to um, incorporate UNHCR Rohingyas into the, the, the agenda of, of the ASEAN that was protested at the end and he has failed and people also criticize ASEAN that Many countries in ASEAN don't really have the real willingness or genuine intention of addressing this issue because many stakeholders within the state structure still benefit from um, undemocratic regime, you know, of of of, of Myanmar, right? But however, it's important for civil society and the international community to assert pressure on ASEAN, especially when uh, Burma is. Um, going to leave ASEAN, and some of the officials have been sent uh, to Brunei to be trained. So this can be actually the channels to constructively engage with the uh, Burmese authorities. Um, okay. Right. That's it for now, and perhaps we can just open for discussions. Yes, brothers and sisters also come to us. The question that I would love a uh, sense from you on is if it was up to the Rohingya to decide where they go to call home, where would that be? 
there's a certain circle background, if you ask them, they would say that they belong to our kind that they are people of the land and so have been there since seven centuries, like even before that, right? Um, there was no nation state as such. Some people would say they came from Bangladesh, they might came from Bangladesh, but they would say that their ancestors, or even they themselves, went to Bangladesh because of war and violence, and they wanted to come back. So they had a strong sense of attachment to the land, and they, all, they always want to come back to, to our kind of state. Question here, yeah. but uh, when uh, about the Rohingya, uh, actually always uh, the the Burma, the Burma administration they also they always like them. Like uh, you said, uh, in Bunu administration they accept the Rohingya as an ethnic group. But you are saw they have a identity like a in Thai like a, a green color, but not color. They saw that, but uh, after that they another government said we draw them, no stop. See, the Burmese government only act like that. Let's see, for example, before they said, Kachin, they, the Kachin signed for 17 years. Then after that, they said government, and they said, okay, that is forgetting. That is a new government. Only like that. But one thing is, I want to ask, always the Burmese uh, uh, government has been denied that uh, uh, Rohingya is not the uh, ethnic of Myanmar, Burma. So, that is, I want to, my question is, uh, why is the uh, relation between the uh, Arakan state and uh, the Rohingya and uh, Bangladesh. What, do they have any relationship? Because only the Burmese government said, oh, this, the Rohingya people are coming from Bangladesh. And Bangladesh say, oh, they, they is not our people. So what the relationship is that? And another question, second question is, um, why the UN don't accept the Rohingya to be resettled? Like other groups, like a refugee people. That is my, my question. Okay. Um, just briefly respond to the first question about Rohingya and Bangladesh. The Bangladesh government denies Rohingya as a Bangladeshi, and Bangladesh and Rohingya also deny that they are Bangladeshi. Right? <laughs> because they, 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 they are from Myanmar, they are from Rakhine State, like Mother Yuri, Southern Thailand, they are not Malaysian. They are people of Bhattani, right? They have their own. Um, uh, dialect, even though dialect can be similar to classical Malayu in Malaysia. Uh, my father is Bangladesh, but he also could understand Rohingyas, but then um, he wouldn't be able to speak Rohingya language or dialect, right? So um, they are not, uh, they're not Bangladeshi, first of all, that's the reality. And people who are already in Bangladesh, they always have plea to return back to, to their motherland. About UNHCR, right? UNHCR doesn't have mandate. They cannot even conduct RSD. What at best they could do that is profiling, which is different for R from RSD. Um, they have been convincing Thai government to set up a system. They are willing to mobilize fund and to provide all technical support. But then, um, I think the Thai government would perceive that would be a cool factor that reinforce, you know, more Rohingyas to come in because as long as conflict has not been um, settled or transformed, um, there will always be this possibility of influx of refugees, not just only Rohingya, but also refugees from other countries because now we are hosting refugees from even Africa, Middle East, and other parts of the, of the world. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I have two questions. Yes. Uh, the first question is, what do you think is really the policy driving the persecution of the Rohingya? What is the policy driving the persecution? Does the Burma government want to ethnically cleanse them? Does it want to destroy them? Does it want to simply to persecute them? What do you think is the policy behind it? And in that context, there is a big difference between the treatment of the Karen, which we were hearing about earlier, where the policy is to repatriate them, to coercively repatriate them, here with the Rohingya, the policy seems to be quite different. To exclude, to drive them out, maybe even to destroy them. So what's the policy driving the violations? And the second question is, the anti-Rohingya sentiment is extremely strong throughout Burma. There's enormous hatred for the Rohingya. The widespread across ethnic groups across the Burma. And that's a reality. So my second question to you is, what do you think can be done, i.e. 
working with the AK generation or with Aung Suu Kyi, or what can be done internally to confront this hatred, which is extremely alarming, extremely widespread, and extremely difficult to tackle. Okay, uh, just let me briefly respond to your question. First, about the logic Sorry, behind... Can you oh, summarize okay. the question? Yeah. The, first, the, quest, the first question, what is logic behind um, the Burmese government, right? What actually, what are the reasons behind this um, uh, so-called ethnic cleansing or uh, genocide policy of the Burmese government? Um, the second question, what can be done in order to um, deal or respond to this um, <coughs> religious hatred right, or anti-Islam um, sentiment uh, or anti rohingya sentiment? Okay. So, no one actually knows what is the real intention behind the government, um, but we can only assume based on our analysis and our work um, in Burma. Basically, now the, the government uh, is calling itself democratic regime, right? But they're also trying to remind the public that it's important to uh, have military intervene. Uh, you remember that at first, in response to the uh, crisis in 2012, it was the police that was the one in charge. Later on, when military intervened, after the government declared emergency decree, they were able to somehow pacify the situation. That actually reminded the public of the efficiency of the military in controlling the situation, keeping peace and order in the country. At the same time, you also see that um, you have spill over effect. The anti Rohingya sentiment is not only in Rakhine state, you have anti Muslim sentiment across the country now. And you also see the actor, as you said, uh, 969, Man Ratu. He is traveling across the country, not just only in Arakan state. He went to Metila, he traveled to Shan state, he traveled to, um, uh, to, Karen, uh, to Karen state, and the other one is, yeah, Park, yeah many, many areas. And the common incident that took place after the sermon is the attack on Muslim community or destruction of mosques. Okay? Um, you find that the places where he visited also share the same similarities or problems. The, 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 the corporation, um, the, the, the Chinese transnational corporations, and you have the investment in other um, uh, of the investment of other other countries are coming in. So they're trying to actually divide the attention of the um, public from the, the underlying. Um, problems that are being faced by people in the society. At the same time, they try to keep the country um, divided. Because if you see, now, um, in order to prevent to, to achieve the, the general democracy is, 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 is only through keeping people divided. What we are trying to do in, in, in addressing this, this issue, um, we also see a positive sign in response to this crisis. You have an organized interfaith network in Myanmar that try to bring people from different ethnic groups, religious groups to come together and analyze the conflict in the country and they have actually found out this. We also did the same. We actually conducted the intra-faith, intra-ethnic dialogue with the Rakhine Buddhists and also Rohingya Muslim, right? First, they view history differently. Um, the Rakhine view um, Rohingyas as the immigrants, Why the um, they also feel that the international community keep talking about plight of Rohingya. Rakhine are also being deprived of basic human rights. They are also victimized by the Burmese government. Some, even, some of them even said that, okay, we first kill Rohingya, then we kill more Burman, right? They also perceive Burmans as, uh, as the enemy. Um, so it's really important to actually understand uh, the perspective and view. They, are, they, they, they feel that the issue of Rohingya have sidelined um, the plight of, 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 of the Rakhine um, Buddhists. So basically to our analysis, first they want to maintain victory power. If you look at relationship between Uwiratu, he had a strong connection with um, Tansue. And before the major incidents, there were a series of meetings between Uwiratu and Tansue. So basically he's being used by the military to maintain victory power. Um, in this so-called democratic uh, process. Uh, you want to continue? Okay, I saw your hand. Yes, um, I want to know a little bit more about the leadership. Um,
you were talking about leaders of Rohingya. Okay, so basically they were demobilized um, by the sub uh, military uh, suppressions, uh, and they, are, they, they have been very small, and they were suppressed because the military, uh, uh, the Burmese military army has always been, you know, stronger than than, than the uh, Rohingya army. Some of them have been somehow. Um, sucked into the system. You found that many of the prominent Muslim or even uh, Rohingya Muslim in in in, in, in Yangon are hesitant to talk, to talk about the plight of Rohingyas. Many of them are holding prominent positions in the government, not representing Rohingya's party, but in the government. Even there is one. Um, okay, some of them are Muslim, but they prefer not to be identified as Rohingyas. You may know that one of the uh, ADB director, ADB director was Burmese Muslim, the executive director. So it's either through suppression uh, by force or through different kind of incentive to assimilate them into the um, system. Um, have you presented the talk here in the presence of uh, government representative of Burma? And if so, what would be their reactions? And all would uh, have you publish, you know, your analysis from your organization? And did you get any kind of response from a uh, government official uh, from Burma, officially or uh, unofficially? Thank you. We have to work publish um, any works uh, about Rohingyas. Um, first of all, because we actually have uh, the programs in Myanmar and also in Rakhine kind of State. Um, so we try to keep ourselves local fine. But we did have dialogue with many groups. As I mentioned, we did have the intra-group dialogue with um, different ethnic groups. We actually brought um, representatives of different ethnic groups, in, 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 including um, Rakhine uh, Buddhist leaders, to, to Bangkok. Right? Some of our participants are also um, officials who can be more open-minded and progressive yet they disagree with some of the analysis. And what I'm presenting is actually not um, my personal view. When we talk about historical background, it's all about interpretation of evidences, inter evidence of scattering and interpretation of evidences. And interpretation is really based on the lenses that you wear, um, put on. So basically, when we have this kind of dialogue, it actually helps um, the officials, different people of different ethnic groups, to understand different perspectives, and it's pretty important to actually do so-called conflict analysis collectively, right? <coughs> to actually have a holistic analysis of the conflict of the country, it's important to incorporate different views, even though the views can be contradictory. You understand that um, people have uh, different goals of analysis, and there are different factors behind such mindset and attitude. Um, so, of course, people may disagree, and people come, often disagree with one another when it comes to this very important issue. Um, some even, you know, say to the extent that we don't want to talk to Rohingyas because they just came to our country recently, right? Which is contradictory to um, the solid evidences presented by many scholars who have been, you know, specialized in this group, studied um, Rohingyas for a long time. Sorry, I listened and I have to translate um, a talk by the president of Thai Rohingya people one time, a few years here. And then I think someone in the audience asked uh, him uh, that if you want to understand the Rohingya issue in Burma, you have to put that in the perspective of the master on the, on the, as a global issue because of 9-11 and so on and so forth, and Arab Spring and so other things that in the organization have you tried to do that uh, with a, a comprehensive uh, analysis? Thank you. Um, actually, our organization is uh, Asian Muslim Action where we are a network of Muslims, um, scholars and activists throughout Asia. And of course, the members of uh, our organization also hold diverse different views. They don't necessarily agree with one another. Um, we also have the international um, gathering to really discuss about the issue of Rohingyas. We also recognize that um, 
uh, there are many weaknesses in Muslim community, right? Some of the prejudices are actually reaffirmed by the acts of, of um, Muslim who do not represent Islam, right? Um, at the same time, we also, we also have interfaith dialogue with our Buddhist community, and they always say that uh, what we are to and 969 movement are doing are not at all um, endorsed by Buddhist community and obviously contradictory to Buddhist principles. But then, what is more important than international dimension? It's important to understand the political motivation in the country. Right? The construction of image of the enemy to maintain division in the society and uh, reinforce so-called hegemony within, within Myanmar. So the government is not using um, physical force to control the people. Rather now they are using kind of the hege hegemonic element, which is uh, controlling of mindset, uh, keep people busy with um, fighting with each other to hatred instead of getting organized and deal with the common issue. One of the outcomes of the consultation that we organize, um, and we plan to do it more with young people, because young people have more tendency to, you know, um, open and be like people and are better than adults, is to um, have a collective bottom effort of drafting new constitution that can be more embracing, right? Ter tolerating um, and accommodating people of all ethnic groups. So we have to look at Rohingya's community and we also recognize that there are many divisions between Rohingyas, both in Thailand and also in Myanmar. They are fighting among themselves over conflict of interest. This is something that we need to recognize. Um, at the same time, um, they will have to ask themselves how they can be organized and involved, engaged constructively um, with other ethnic groups to become more understanding, um, remove prejudices, and to collectively overcome the common challenges, right? So it can only be possible through dialogue, right? Yes. yes. Last year, there were news reports that at least two Rohingya leaders were found to be receiving support and training in Indonesia from an, from an organization, an extremist Muslim organization that's been classified as a terrorist group. And I want to know, do you, do you see a potential for this becoming a trend that if the Buddhist Muslim conflict continues in Burma, more Muslims from Burma will be seeking partnerships with extremist Muslim groups in, in other countries? I don't, I don't see why it's not possible, right? Um, but again, we have to refine information. For example, one of the reasons why the Thai government wanted to get rid of Rohingya is because they, they associate Rohingya with the so called extremist group in the south, in southern Thailand, which is which is not. I've been working with South Sudan and we work closely with the military, with the um, security forces. Very clear that they are not involved at all, right? Uh, we also work with some insurgents in the South too. Um, this is again the government rhetoric try to justify, uh, you know, deportation of Rohingya. When it comes to Indonesia, I don't know about this, but I think it's possible because, as I mentioned, that the attack on uh, Putrajaya in India. People say that the evidence was done by a group of Rohingyas, but they're not very organized. And now they are gaining more sympathy, especially from extremist groups in different Muslim countries. Now they have more Rohingyas in uh, Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia has a tendency to spread kind of uh, conservative, um, very extreme ideology, right? Um, so there is a high possibility. And, it's a spillover effect because you find that many of the Burmese, non-Muslim Burmese immigrant workers in many countries are treated badly by the um, uh, Muslim employers, right? And it's been reinforced by this incident. You heard about the killing of um, the Burmese workers who were detained in Aceh and they were killed by, you know, the people inside. So. This can always happen, it can spill over, it can even reinforce the ethnic conflict in other countries and possibility of, you know, uh, reinforcing extremism. Yes, sister. So, what's your uh, perspective on trying to change uh, the situation and with instilling peace in the time, in a safe way, uh, people 
hear what, what they say to me about it. It's too tense, too sensitive now to be yeah, peaceful. <coughs> what is your Okay, it's very sensitive. Okay, it's very sensitive. It's not uh, impossible because we are trying to do interfaith dialogue first, right? When you do interfaith dialogue or interfaith dialogue, you actually understand the complexity between your own community, and you are actually better prepared to um, dialogue with people of other groups. So this approach we have adopted, and we have adopted uh, one small program. We actually promoted entrepreneurship program between Buddhists and Muslims in Arakan State. They started doing a small uh, business project that actually helped them interact with, with one another without discussing about conflict, right? So that, and that actually helped them better understand. And once they are able to develop confidence, they are brought to Bangkok and then perhaps discuss a dialogue um, about deeper issues. So that's one, one of the possibilities. And then, again, not just only working our time step, it's a national problem with a common good. It's important to involve people of every ethnic groups to have common understanding, develop um, sympathy towards people in our time state. And, and do you have experience with these activities also? Yeah. In, in, in the time, is it? Yeah. Oh, she, she was asking um, whether I have been working in our time state and what can be the possible uh, programs or concrete actions to promote um, peace building understanding among the polarized community. So that was definitely her question. That was my answer. Yes. One more, one last question. Um, someone in a meeting somewhere said you have to look into the issue where um, which the Burmese uh, government working not directly, openly, closely with China. Because China really, you know, uh, has strong stand on Western and oppressive in a way. So I don't know whether uh, there would be uh, enough evidences uh, to link because uh, the Burmese government, I think, worked closely in, in directly or, uh, you know, out, not openly in uh, China. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, and I think it's very important of us to actually understand the international implications and foreign policy. Um, but again, it's very clear, as I mentioned um, in, re in my response to the first question, that um, there's a clear Chinese interest inside Myanmar that affect many states, not just only what kind of state. And it's a government attempt to deviate people's attention from uh, drawing Chinese influence uh, and how it's constructive, uh, disruptively affected the people. I think it's, 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 it's still time for a complicated question. Uh, I did my uh, research uh, for my doctoral uh, work in Rwanda. And there, uh, in the people who were accused of having migrated there were killed. Uh, so in Rwanda it was like that, that 85% uh, majority are Hutus, which means servants. And there was an elite minority, Tutsis, and these Tutsis were uh, killed in a genocide in 1994 with the argument that they had come from the north of Africa and had come to Rwanda and that they were not Rwandese and when they were killed they were, their bodies were thrown into the river and it was said okay now they can go back home their bodies can go back home in the river so uh, they, they see the uh, same kind of narrative you are not from here, you have come from somewhere else, we don't want you, please go, go away or we kill you. And in Rwanda they actually killed them. Um, and uh, my research was to try to find out a little bit more about the background. And uh, my research focuses on humiliation, the dynamics of humiliation. And what I found was that at the bottom of it was not ethnicity, 
not conflict of interest. Uh, this all was in a way secondary and was instrumentalized. Um, and that at the bottom there were some kind of kinds of dynamics of humiliation, which uh, which were changing. In the past, to be a servant was acceptable, and now we live in times where servitude is no longer acceptable, it's a humiliating state of being. And in that transition of the meaning of humiliation, this happened and all the other uh, factors were kind of secondary. So this is a very complicated question, but it relates to your question about the hatred. You know, in, in Rwanda, I was so, uh, when I came there, I expected to study killing, genocide, I think, you think it's about killing, but it was not about killing. It was about expressing hatred towards those to be killed. The main point was to humiliate them before killing them, uh, to strip them naked, let them be eaten uh, by dogs, raping them. So the killing was only kind of the last step, but the most important thing was the, the humiliation of the victims. Uh, found out different elements of humiliation and actually these are the result of the systematic uh, indoctrination of um, of demonization, right? Because when once you, you demonize someone and you don't see human value, you don't see human dignity in your constructed image of the enemy um, and you feel better uh, to, to kill or to humiliate um, that person and actually you can see these elements um, in, in the community. For example, the term used to refer to, uh, to Muslim in general is Kala, right? And Kala basically means black people with dark skin and it's very degradatory. Uh, um, uh, some people actually interpret the term Kala as untouchable, you know, someone that's very um, dirty. Um, and they also know that Muslim cannot uh, cannot be cremated, cannot be burned, so they have to be buried after they uh, upon the, the depart uh, from the world. So we found certain incidents like in Mektila that many children were burned alive in the school, right? So that's one of the form of humiliation. And I would say that many of the Buddhists um, in both a kind and, 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 and um, what you call uh, other states, they have this sense of sympathy uh, to, to Rohingya, but those who are humiliated, right? Many of them even try to defend. But then this 969 group actually came up with a policy that if you uh, express your solidarity or sympathy to so called enemy or these people, then you are part of them. So many of the Buddhists who actually try to help or express the sympathy became humiliated, right? Or even associated as agent of these people. So it's very systematic. And when you talk about this problem, it's not structural problem, only policy or law of the government, but also the mindset of the people, the cultural dimension, which has to come into um, culture of violence, right? That need to be dealt with. In fact, we did discuss about that in the gathering, and we came up with ideas. You know, uh, the young people themselves came up with the ideas of having a kind of the um, history textbooks. Okay, that talks about different narrative. So, on the same incidents, you may have the narrative of Rohingyas, and you have the same narrative of Rakhine, which can be totally different. And you have the central space, central column for the students or audience to interpret by themselves. Because again, uh, history of incidences are about evidence of scattering and interpretation, right? So this kind of dialogue, intra group dialogue, and come to interfaith dialogue, would somehow help individuals discover hidden prejudices that they have and also challenge their own prejudice by understanding how these prejudices have been developed. And this doesn't come naturally, it came to the system, either a system at a community level or state level, right? So what is important is the um, dialogue, 
But again, dialogue requires supporting an appropriate atmosphere for people to um, liberate themselves from fear. Right? Even the majority who think differently can also be in fear too. Yeah, so it's a very challenging, um, uh, challenging task. It's, it's, it's important to conduct this kind of studies and research, but what is more important, how do you enable inside the active stakeholders in the conflict to be critical and be able to emancipate themselves to understand that they are being the victim of humiliation as well. Thank you very much.